Well, I hope you're not done celebrating because um, I couldn't think of a better way to follow up Easter than Baptism Sunday. Y'all ready for Baptism Sunday? Come on, one of my favorite weekends of the year. And it's one of my favorite because you're gonna see the vision of LifePoint on full display. Now, the vision of our church is very clear, very simple. We want you to live your fullest life in Jesus. Don't just be saved and stuck or saved and bound. We want you to understand the power of what grace does in your life to live what we call your fullest life. And you're about to see that here in a few moments. And so I'm gonna put all my cards on the table, can I? There's no cute preacher tricks today. I'm just gonna show you my hand. I really do believe that there are many of you, not, not a few, not some, many of you, who your next step is you need to be baptized today. Like in the next 27 minutes and 13 seconds today. Like pastor, I didn't come prepared and I didn't sign up. That's okay. We're going to, we're going to talk about that in a second, that this might be a significant moment for you today. So y'all know, y'all know your boy. I can't just title this message today, baptism Sunday. I mean, that's not creative. Instead for my note takers, I want to uh, speak to you from this subject right here. You ready? Keep it simple. Come on, type it in the chat, online campus. Keep it simple simple. I've just discovered that just because something is simple doesn't mean it's not significant. Matter of fact, I would actually make a case in an argument that the inverse is true, that most of the significant things in my life really are simple. And that's good for me because I'm, I'm a simple guy. Any other simple people in the house today? I'm, I'm simple. I really am. Because when things get confusing, um, I, get, I get frustrated. The more confusing something is, then I don't know what to do. And if I don't know what to do, then I often end up doing nothing. And I think things that are very complicated communicates lack of clarity. I'll prove it to you. The Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> Come on, how many of you love you some Cheesecake Factory? Let's go. I love Cheesecake Factory. I'm with you. It's, 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 the, it's the spot. I just can't eat there anymore. I can't. And let, let me tell you why. Number one, take reservations, Cheesecake Factory. Yeah, thank you, Derek, on the front row. It's like, you're always at a 50 minute wait, okay? It could be Tuesday at 3 p.m. and it's an hour away. Just take reservations. Can I get this off my chest? This is cheaper than counseling. This feels, this feels really good. But really the real reason I can't go there is because of their menu. Have y'all seen a cheesecake factory menu? Look, I did the math for you. I, here's the cliff notes. There are over 250 items on the Cheesecake Factory menu, consisting of 21 different pages. Like, you know your menu, it's too complex, there's no clarity, when you're literally selling ads just to cover the cost of the menu. <laughs> not, not to mention, there's an additional two pages now that I discovered called the skinny Skinnylicious section. <laughs> like, can we just be real, all right? If you are going to the Cheesecake Factory counting calories, you're in the wrong spot, bro, all right? Go get a smoothie, all right? Go to Viva Chicken. I mean, you're not going to Cheesecake Factory counting calories. So listen, for a guy like me, I'm, I'm very simple. I sit down. When they hand me a 23-page menu, y'all, I get an anxiety attack. I mean, seriously, like, do you really need to have, you know, meatloaf and Korean fried chicken on the same menu? It just doesn't, it doesn't work with me. And, and, and when something's complicated, I get frustrated. And when I get frustrated... I don't know what to do. And that's why I think today we've got to keep it simple. Everyone shout, keep it simple. And I don't know what it is about the propensity of the human nature, but we tend to overcomplicate things, don't we? We tend to over, overcomplicate God, overcomplicate theology, overcomplicate church. My goodness, maybe the reason why some of you have been so church resistant is because last time you were in church, it was so confusing. And you walked in, it's like you stepped back into 1950 and people are talking weird and they're dressing different. And it's almost like there's this like subculture called Christian and you weren't sure if you belonged in it because you didn't speak like them, act like them, look like them. It's just, it's confusing. And I understand the tension, by the way, of what I just said. I get it. Um, God is very complex. And the complex nature of a God is hard for us in our finite minds to understand. This is an infinite God. So I understand that there's a complexity of God that we'll never fully understand. However, God has actually given to us his moral will on how to live our fullest lives. It's clear and it's simple. And sometimes you might meet a Christian once in a while who likes to focus on the complexity of God so they don't have to be obedient to the simplicity of his word. 
Woo, I just on, am I preaching this thing right here? I'm, look, I am preaching for your Tuesday, for your Wednesday. Stop focusing on the things that we don't understand and let's just be obedient with what we do. Yeah, we gotta keep it, we gotta keep it simple. And I think an area where we have really overcomplicated things in the church is 100% this area of baptism. I've been pastoring now for almost 16 years and I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with somebody about baptism. And they look at me when I talk about baptism, like I just handed them a 23 page, 250 menu item of the Cheesecake Factory. And so here's what I wanna to do today. I wanna to teach you on what baptism is very clearly, very simply, but yet very significantly so that you can take this step of baptism. And then I wanna answer all of your excuses, refute them so you can get baptized today. Sound good? All right, I wanna to go to Acts, um, Acts 16 today. If you got a Bible, let's go there. Y'all bring your Bibles today? Do we bring Bibles to church anymore? A couple of you do? do? Does your Bible glow? Does it light up? Okay, it counts, it, it works. Acts chapter 16 is where we're gonna, we're gonna land. It's gonna be our landing point. Let me kind of let you in on kind of where the story of Jesus is in Acts 16. Um, Jesus has already arose from the grave last Sunday. We celebrated that, ascended into heaven. And there's this new movement called the way. Matter of fact, early Christians weren't even called Christians. They didn't know what to call them, just this movement of the way. And they're starting these New Testament churches. And so they go to these different towns and different cities, guys like Paul and Silas, who we're gonna read about today. And they're starting these little house churches and they're very successful. They go into a town like Philippi where they're able to uh, call out demons and raise people and do incredible miracles, which is really significant because Philippi was very heavy in, in sorcery, sort of fortune telling. And so Paul and, si uh, Paul and Silas come in, they preach about Jesus and they're literally driving out demons out of people. Bible's awesome, y'all just gotta read it, it's amazing. And so this is good for the person, but bad for business because there's these pimps and these pushers who are basically using these people who are bound by demons and they're making a profit off of their bondage. And so like these guys don't like it. So they organize this mob and basically they take Paul and they take Silas and they throw them into prison. In Acts 16, we pick up, Paul and Silas are under lock and key under a Roman guard, Acts 16, verse 25. If you're ready, shout, I'm ready. ready. Come on online, I hear you, here we go. It says about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Man, if I had time, I would, I would tell you that your, your worship, it, it impacts more than just you, that people are listening to your life. Your life is producing a sound. I just wonder what is it producing? All right, Nate, stay disciplined. Verse 26, it says, suddenly there was such a violent earthquake and the foundation of the prison was shaken. And at once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. And the jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. The reason why the guard was doing that because in this Roman culture, if you lost a prisoner, it was their life for yours. He's like, I might as well just go ahead and end my life because that's what my superiors are gonna do to me. But watch what they said, verse 28. But Paul shouted, hey, hey man, don't, don't harm yourself. Put, Put the sword down, we're, we're all here. And the jailer called for the lights and they rushed in. They fell trembling before Paul and Silas and he then brought them out and he says, sir, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. And at the hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately, that's a important word today, immediately he and all his household were baptized there's our word baptized. The jailer brought them into the house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. Wow. I wanna just really pull out two words in this text today and really teach on very simply on what baptism is. The first word I wanna pull out is this word, believe. Believe. We see it in verse 30 and 31. Here's what he says. He says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Life point, this is, this is so convicting because this jailer is basically watching Paul and Silas. They're in a Roman prison, middle of the night, probably hurt, wounded, and they're singing hymns to God. And somehow God hears that and this earthquake happens and they're freed and then the unthinkable happens. They don't pull a Harrison Ford and the fugitive. They literally stay. They're like, no, man, listen, we're, we're here. And this man watches their faith and he says, I don't, I don't know what it is that you got, 
but whatever it is, I want it. And life point, the reason why this is so convicting is because as followers of Jesus, people should be looking at the way you live your life, I live my life, saying the same thing. Man, I don't know what it is about you, but whatever it is, I gotta have it. I mean, like you, you parent different. You, you're in a different, like you speak to your spouse differently. You don't seem stressed out and anxious and you don't get caught up in all these like Facebook debates and all this political stuff that's taking place. You, you just walk with joy. You got happiness and I know you've been through some stuff, but you're still happy and you still got joy. You, you handle your money differently. I don't know what it is that you got, but I want it. And I wonder how many of us are people looking at the way we're living our lives going, that's what I want. Or let's be honest, are we so concerned about fitting in with the world that we're not standing out for Christ? He goes, I want, I want what you have. Verse 31, here's our word. They go, okay. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. Everyone shall believe. believe. I love this because when he asked them, what is it that I need? They said, you need to believe in the Lord Jesus. You know, you might ask me, okay, well, what does this guy need to believe in? I would tell you that there are two things that you have to believe in in order to experience the salvation and the grace of Jesus. The first thing that you have to really believe is that your sin is so severe that it has separated you from a holy, loving God. That my sin, which is my error, my wrong, you, you, you were born into a broken, flawed world, by the way. This is why you don't have to teach toddlers how to sin. They come pre-hardwired. No. You know, it's like, it's what I do. I, I disobey you. You got to teach me good, right? That's because that's of this sinful nature that we have. Man, we saw this on full display this past week, didn't we? The brokenness of our world right here when national news hit our community and our thoughts and our prayers go to everybody in Rock Hill is... Well, beloved doctor, family, grandkids were murdered. And we pray for the family and we pray for the victims. It's, it's horrible, it's horrible all the way around. And every time I hear those stories, I just am reminded that this, this world is not our home. It's not our final destination. And we desperately need Jesus. And your sin, this is, this is the chasm now. God's over here, you're over here. Your sin is actually offensive to God. Did you know that? Your sinful nature before Jesus made you an enemy of God. Yeah, we don't like to preach that, but it's, it's true. Paul told us, Romans chapter five, verse 10. I gotta back it up with the word. Look what he says here. Paul says, for if while we were God's enemies, before Jesus, your sin made you an enemy of God. You, but well, here's the good part. You were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? In other words, church, we can't just look at sin and go, I mean, Come on, man, it's just, I just made a bad choice. Like, it's all good. Like, you can't give sin the wink, the wink and the gun. It's no big deal. Like, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Like, I, even Christians, I'm saved by grace. I'll just go out and do whatever I want and then swipe my prepaid grace card. Look, if that's how you've been treating sin, you haven't met grace. You've met some religious concept. Grace is a person. Grace, is, grace will change you. And, 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 and I want us to see this because if we don't see how offensive our sin is to God because it's what separates you from him and he loves you and wants to be in a relationship with you, then you'll never see your desperation to be saved. In other words, you can't save somebody who doesn't think they need to be saved. So you gotta believe. This is a, this is a big deal. Here's the second thing you have to believe, that Jesus Christ came to this earth and he paid my sin dead in full. He bridged the gap between where I am and where God is. And I am now wholly righteous in his name, not because of me, but because of Christ in me. And on that day on Calvary, we just sang the song uh, on Good Friday, when that blood spilled down the cross, it was more than just blood. It was the transaction that was required to pay your, my sin debt in full. That right now in heaven, are you ready for this? If you're in Christ Jesus, you have a zero balance, past, present, hold on, future sin, all because of what Jesus has done. Isn't that good news? Somebody better, yeah, just be reminded. You might've been walking with the Lord for 50 years. That never gets old. And so he goes, I want what you have. And I find it so interesting that they don't look at him and they don't say, all right, um, here's the deal, bro. You want what I got? Uh, you need to sign up for this six week course. And after the six week course, if we confirm that this is really taking place in your life, then let's, let's talk about salvation. No, they, they don't look at him. I'm gonna mess some of you religious people up. They don't say, hey, um, you, you really need to download the YouVersion Bible app, get a Bible plan. 
and then you need to watch season one and two of The Chosen, because that's now what Christians do. We watch The Chosen. And then in six months, if this is still maybe something that you're serious about, mm, come back and talk, and I'll see if you are approved. Now, they don't even tell this man to stop sinning. Hey, we know you're battling some stuff. You need to go change your behavior if you want to follow Jesus. No, no, no. They just simply said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Can I tell you some really great news today? Religion starts at the point of behavior. Jesus starts at the point of belief. Religion will lie to you. It will tell you that it is your behavior that triggers your, your, your belief. It's not true. It is your belief that will begin to shape and transform your behavior. Don't try to get it backwards or you'll be frustrated your whole life. He says, just, you want what we got? Oh man, this is good news. It's free for everybody. Just believe in who Jesus is. So he believed. Here's the second word I want you to write down. It's the word immediately. So look at this, verse 33. At the hour of the night, the jailer took them. He washed their wounds. Then immediately he and his whole household were baptized. Shout immediately. Immediately. I love the faith. I love the swag of this jailer. I wanna meet him in heaven one day. I can't wait. Because this is, I think, should be the posture of our faith. He goes, all right, what I need to believe? All right, I, I believe Jesus is who he said he is. I'm, I'm trusting him with my eternal security and my salvation. What's next? Oh, baptism? Okay, let's, let's go do it. Baptism? It, shouldn't that be our heart? God, what you want from me next? It's, whatever you want, predetermined yes. It's yes, come on, what you got? That's why at LifePoint we say all the time that everybody has a next step. We all do. And again, I love this because his response to baptism, he didn't say to Paul and Silas, baptism, you know what? Um, I'm gonna need to pray about that. Oh, get baptized, yeah, that's a really neat idea. Um, I should probably go home, talk to my wife, and uh, I'll text you if that's kind of the step that I wanna take. I mean, ooh, you know, see, here's the thing, um, Paul Silas, I don't think you realize that I don't like water. It's not really like, you know, like I just got my hair did and I don't have the, you know, the, the mascara waterproof and I'm gonna come out looking like a hot mess. And I just think that maybe I, mm, I don't like crowds of people. I'm more of a private person. Uh-huh, am I saying maybe what you've been excusing? He just simply goes, no, 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 no. What do I need to do? And it says immediately he was baptized. You, you know why this is so important? It's because delayed obedience is disobedience. I love you enough to tell you this. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Y'all got kids? Mm -hmm. Someone does. Someone's got some kids that are real. It's like, I'm doing this first time listening thing and you're not getting it. It's the same thing. I'm with you. It's my kids. My kids are crazy. And I'm like, listen, it'd be like you looking at your child going, um, you need to take out the trash. Hey, sweetheart, it's, it's time to clean the room. And imagine your offspring that you gave life to looks at you and says, ooh, dad, trash. You know, I, um, it's not really my thing, you know, kind of get a little messy and it's quite the walk to the trash can outside. Let me, um, let me think about that. Ooh, my bedroom? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna need to pray about that. And if, Oh man, if that was my kid, which it is my kid, I'd be like, boy, you better pray really long because when you say amen, you're gonna be standing in front of Jesus. <laughs> Y'all don't have to spank your kids. That's fine. Do what you want in your house. But as for me in my house, all right, stop it. That's, now you're talking preacher, right? But, and I know you're like, man, but Nate, like, why, are, why is this such a big deal? And, and here, here, here's my heart, you ready? You'll never be ready for what's next if you're not first obedient with what's now. Man, we get so obsessed with next in our culture, don't we? I, I gotta get out of high school and then I gotta get into college and I gotta go to the right college and I gotta get the right degree and I gotta find the right person and then I'm gonna get the career and the next job and the next house and the next spouse and the next thing and the next kid and the next promotion, next experience, next, next. And I just wonder, church, do we, do, do we almost overemphasize next and underestimate now? Can I tell you something about God? If you will be faithful and obedient with now, the doors of next will automatically open in front of you. Stop talking about next when you won't even be obedient with what's now. I am preaching better than you're responding. That's okay. No, no, I got it. I got it. I got it. <laughs> and I'm with you. Listen, I preach this sermon to myself. I'm like, I don't even want to hear that because it's convicting, isn't it? It's like, all right, God, what do you want for me? And immediately his life changed. So here's what I thought to myself, church. I thought, okay, if I was you sitting in the seat, maybe watching online, 
And, 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 and if I was you and you, you were me, what questions would I have about baptism? So I wrote four questions down that I would have, and I want to answer all four of those so that you can get baptized today. Here's the first question. If I was you, I would ask, okay, Pat, what, what is baptism? What is baptism? I mean, I understand the physical expression of it. Like I understand y'all getting water, but like, why can't I just go to the local pool? You call me down three, two, one, and I do a cannonball and we call it good, <laughs> right? What is baptism? I, um, I just believe that um, if you really wanna know what something is, we should look at what the word literally means. Cause again, we're just gonna keep it simple today. And every time you see the word baptism in the New Testament, like we're about to see in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, it always means the same thing. So let's look. This is the mouth of Jesus right before he ascends into heaven. This is often known as the Great Commission, the final thing that Jesus would say to his followers. He says, therefore, go now and make disciples of all nations. That's the game plan, by the way. That's why we're here. We are in the disciple making business of all nations, and here it is, how do we do it? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus says, all right, here, here, here's, here, here's what we're gonna do, guys. The mission is yours now, and I'm gonna work in and through you, but I want you to make disciples, followers, that's what the word means, students of Jesus. People love me, cherish me, walk with me. But it starts with them giving their life to me and then going public with that decision in this act called baptism. Now, if I can get a little, um, if I can get geeked out on you for a minute, the word baptized in the New Testament comes from the Greek word baptizo. And this word baptizo, it was not a religious word. It was a very common word because it means to dip under, to submerge. Now, we typically reserve the word baptism for like church settings like this, don't we? Like you don't look at somebody and say, hey man, let's go take a baptize in the lake. Like, bro, you're weird, Okay. But in this culture, it was a very common word. For example, um, you, you would see it a lot like in the marketplace. You would have a woman or maybe a man and imagine uh, they have a piece of cloth that they wanna dye and they wanna sell that fabric. So they would take that cloth, they maybe put red in the water, follow the illustration here, and they take that cloth, they baptize it, soak it, submerge it. And in that process of dyeing, the, the dye color is forever grafted into that new fabric so that when you bring that fabric up out of the water, it is forever permanently that color. This is baptism. That when you and I, uh, it's this outward symbol of what Christ has done on the inside of you. So I go underneath the water, representing my death to the old self. This is Jesus going into the tomb. It's my watery grave. Then I come up out of the water, representing my new life in Christ. And the power of this is in that moment, I am forever grafted, never to be separated, never be removed from the love of Jesus Christ. This is why Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, look, look what Paul says. He says it like this. He goes, therefore, man, if anybody is in Christ, the new creation has come and the old has gone. The new is here. Look, when I thought about this, um, this new creation. I thought about shopping. How many of y'all like to shop? Come on, be honest. Yeah, don't front. We know you do. Amazon visits your house more than your neighbors do. We, we got you. Um, I like to shop. I'm not gonna tell you whether me or my wife shop more. I'll let you decide that. But I, when I was reading this, it, it reminded me of like awards shows. You're like, for example, the Oscars. Uh, my wife loves the Oscars, but her favorite part of the Oscars is actually the red carpet party before. So she's thrown red carpet Oscar parties at our house. I have never been more out of place than a red carpet party with a lot of women. But if you know the red carpet, it's not about the actors. The red carpet's all about the designers. Like the girl gets out and they're like, ooh, what is she wearing? Is that a Chanel? That, I don't know, designers. Like, you know, it's all about who the person is wearing. And I love that because I think that's what, that, that's what Paul's talking about. That the moment, man, you give your life to Jesus, you go public with that decision, you come up out of the water, people should be looking at your life going, ooh, what are you wearing? That must be a new clothes line. I've never, oh, what's it called? That's called Jesus Christ? Man, that looks like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and self-control. I mean, I, I want that line. <laughs> Jesus has clothed, this is beautiful imagery. He's clothed you with himself. That's what makes me worthy in the eyes of God. So what is baptism? It is simply why at life point, when you see this today, we're gonna to take people all the way under the water and every time somebody gets baptized, they're retelling the story of the gospel. It's powerful.
I think the second question that I would have um, after that would be, who should be baptized? Like, who, okay, I, now I know what it is, but who should be baptized? Well, again, let's keep it simple. In the New Testament, there's over 45 examples and all of them have two things in common. Every time you see a baptism in the New Testament, it's always somebody who gets baptized after they give their life to Jesus and they're of an age to make that decision for themselves. I, I've shared my story before. I grew up in a Methodist church when I was um, a, a little kid. And when I was about 18 months, my parents put me in that white bonnet gown and the little hat and made me look like a girl. And they, next thing I know, I'm in front of this guy wearing a white robe and he is literally, get, get, get this, flicking water in my face. <laughs> now, I, did, I, I didn't choose that. And uh, my parents called it a baptism, but again, the word literally means to submerge. If you submerge a baby, you're not gonna be able to, they're gonna come in and take that baby away. And so that was a very significant moment for my parents. That was dedication. And parents, I think we all know this to be true. Man, parents, we make a lot of decisions for our children. And I think we all know in our heart that the one decision we cannot make is for them to receive Christ for themselves. They gotta do that. And then when they do, the next step is baptism. So maybe you're like me, you grew up in a Methodist church or you got sprinkled, maybe a Catholic background. But since then, you had a true encounter with God. Like I was 12 years old on Easter Sunday, gave my life to the Lord. I was immediately baptized. And so maybe you, you, you've given your life to the Lord since then, but you realize, oh my goodness, I've never done that for myself. I would say, why not be baptized then today? Or, or maybe um, you grew up in the South. See, I didn't grow up in the South but I hear all these stories. I've been in the South now for about 18 years and countless stories that you went to a church like this, where it was like every Sunday you showed up and it was almost as if the pastor's job was to make you feel worse than the week before. Okay, some of those laughs are real. You know what I'm talking about? It's like hellfire and brimstone. Like this dude loves him some hell. I mean, and so like you're 10 years old and everybody in your family got baptized when they were 10. So you came home from school and they had a great day at school only to walk into the house and there's the preacher sitting on the couch for a house call. Listen, I don't do house calls. Let me just say that right there. And next thing you know, he's got his little um, don't go to hell toolbox and he opens it up and he gets his blowtorch and he lights it up. And he puts it under your hand and he's like, yeah, that's hot, isn't it? Yeah. Can you imagine burning for eternity? But yet you never burn up. Figure that one out, Timmy. And then you're going to fall forever in darkness and there's spiders and clouds and you're never going to see your parents again. Do you want to go there? I'm like, oh my God, I don't want to go there. I don't like clowns. He's like, all right, then pray this prayer. You're like, okay. So you pray some prayer. Yep, in the pool two weeks later. But it wasn't because you because you wanted to surrender your life to Jesus. It was because you didn't want to go to hell. That dude could have told you to run a lap around the house and you would, have, you would have been out there running a lap around the house. But since then, yes, but since then, you've had a real encounter, not with the God of fear, but with this God of mercy and grace and love. And you realize that God is not a religion to observe, but a relationship to have. And you have genuinely received Christ into your life, but you've never been baptized since then, then I would say, why not do it now? Or maybe you're one of the 33 who gave their life to the Lord last week. And maybe today, like the, the jailer, this is your day. This is your day. Here's the third question I would, I would ask. Goodness, if I was you, this might be the most important. I hear this all the time. Don't I need, don't I need to get my life cleaned up first? I mean, I get it, man, but like, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I'm going through. And I don't know why, but I feel like I'm speaking to somebody very directly today. You are battling an addiction. And there is a stronghold that you haven't been able to break on your own. And you somehow think that that is what disqualifies you or keeping you from taking these steps towards Jesus. Maybe I'm talking to somebody who's been so bound by pornography or you're in a marriage right now, but you're having an affair. Or maybe you're just sitting on some deep lies and wounds. And you think to yourself, no, I can't, man, I, I would be a hypocrite to do that. If that is you, I want you to hear me. You don't get cleaned up to come to Jesus. You come to Jesus and let him clean you up. Come on, somebody clap for the person next to you today. That might not be you, but somebody needs that encouragement. You don't know why I say that? Because you don't need behavior modification. You don't need the 12-step program to stop doing something. What you need is a heart value transplant. 
And the only one that can give you a new set of values at the core is Jesus Christ himself. And so the moment you give your life to Jesus and you take that first step of public proclamation of your faith and you begin to walk with him, all of a sudden you're going to notice this because it happened in my life. You're going to notice that all those things that used to give you pleasure, don't give you pleasure. All those things that used to give you meaning, you don't find meaning anymore. All those cheap thrills, cheap highs, cheap experiences, you're not, you're not cut for that anymore because you, you've got something better. You've got something deeper. You've got this new life that has completely transformed you, not from the outside in, but from the inside out. Listen, if, if you are waiting to get your life cleaned up first to take steps, you'll never take a step. I would say, why not do it? Why not do it now? Hey, if people are going to judge you, let them, let them judge. <laughs> it's between you and the Lord. Here's my final question. Okay, but I still got to get past this one. You know, I didn't come, I didn't come prepared. Interesting you say that. Because this is LifePoint, cue music. This is LifePoint, baby. That was good. And, 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 and we came prepared for you. We go over the top for everything, especially when we throw parties like salvation and baptism. So in a moment, if you're ready to get baptized, we've got a secure changing area with a team there that would love to help you and show you where to go. We have some of our ERT, which is our emergency response team that's gonna guard your belongings just so everything's secure. And if you wanna get baptized today, look, we got, we got a fully alive t-shirt that you're gonna be able to have and to keep as a, as a memory. We've got, we got shorts, we got women's shorts, we got men's shorts. Look, we got women's under, I'm not gonna say panties in church because that's a weird word but he's got flowers on it. We got those, we've got boxers and briefs. We got bras, what else we got? We got combs and hair ties. Like it is our goal that you leave after your baptism looking how you walked in the door. Not, not only that, but family celebrates family, don't we? I'm throwing underwear on the stage. We've got, look, we're gonna celebrate. We got whistles and bells and we're gonna go outside and we're gonna cheer you on into your destiny. I mean, we have thought, I think we've thought of everything to eliminate the excuses for you to take this step today. I know you're nervous. I know your heart is pounding. Don't run from the spirit of God. And as we get ready to close, I wanna, I wanna end with, it's almost where I left off last Sunday. One of the disciples known as Peter, the one that we looked at last week, this beautiful story of restoration. If you're here, you know, Peter denied Jesus and he thought his failure disqualified him. And Jesus met him on the shore of the Sea of Galilee and cooked him breakfast and called him back into ministry. But I saw something I hadn't seen before in Luke chapter 22, the night that Jesus was arrested. I want you to see where Peter is in the story. Verse 52 says, then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers in the temple guard and the elders who came for him. He goes, am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts and you did not lay a hand on me, but this is your hour when darkness reigns. Verse 54, then seizing him, that's Jesus, they led him away and they took him into the house of the high priest, notice this, and Peter followed him at a distance. I, I've read this a hundred times and I never noticed this detail, that when Jesus got arrested, Peter fell back and he followed Jesus at a distance. And to me, this is the application question. This is an all play for all of us, whether you've been baptized or you're ready about to. Here's the question that I wanna know. How do you follow Jesus? How do you follow Jesus? Do you, like Peter, follow him at a distance when times get tough? Or are you one of these people who you're just all in and I follow him close? Look, I'm not playing anymore because I'm so tired of watching so many of you good-hearted, amazing people. You're saved, but you feel like you're bound. And it's because we gotta stop preaching salvation without surrender. We gotta stop watering down this good news story of Jesus. I taught on this a couple weeks ago because the reality is for us today that, that you experience God at the level of your surrender and your obedience. And what I noticed, and this is Peter, if you follow Jesus at a distance, it's very dangerous because in just a few hours, Peter would deny Jesus three times. And here's what I want you to walk away with. Distance always leads to denial. At some point, if Jesus is just this like cool idea, you're ticking into heaven and you follow him at a distance, it's only a matter of time till you're gonna deny him in your marriage. 
You're going to deny him in your finances. You're going to deny him in your purity, single adults. You're going you're to deny him in your purpose, in your job, and all these other things. So this is not some cute little you know, baptism message. This is an urgent plea from your pastor to get close to Jesus. Get close to Jesus. So I've done everything I know to do to preach this as simple as possible. And now it's your turn to take this step. In a moment, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to stand up and walk out towards the back. We have our next step team back there. Look at the exits, wave guys. Yeah, they're ready for you. They're, they're excited for you. But I wanna tell you who this is not for. Um, this is not for those of you that have already been baptized after you've given your life to the Lord. Hey, if you had a genuine experience with Jesus and you've been baptized, this isn't, you don't need to be rebaptized. You need to be baptized into Life Point Church. Like you're in the church of Jesus Christ. You're good. And I would say, parents, if you have an elementary age child in the auditorium today with you, this is not for them. Let me tell you why. Um, we have an incredible kids ministry team that really has an amazing process. They walked my son through it before he was baptized, that we really want them to understand the gospel and who Jesus is. So if your child wants to be baptized, just here's what I ask. Just mark it on your card. Someone from our kids team would love to get in touch with them. And, and have those steps and talk more about baptism. But other than that, if you know this is your moment, let's do it today. So let's stand up all across this room. And if you're watching online, this goes for you too. Last service, y'all get a load of this. We had somebody watch online with our online campus and literally drove here to get baptized. We're not playing today. We're not messing. This is your moment. It's simple, but it's significant. So on the count of three, I'm gonna say three, and I want you just to get out of your row. You can, you gotta, if you gotta climb over people, climb over people. If you're nervous, bring your mother, bring your daughter, bring, bring somebody with you, and then head to the back, and the rest of us, we're gonna clap, and we're gonna cheer as they walk by us, and we're gonna worship in this song. Are you ready? Come on, are you ready? Let's go, here we go. Three, two, one, let's go, move. You move, yeah. Come on, we got people moving right now. Come on, there's room for you. Let's go, move. This is your moment. This is your now. Come on, let's sing this together about the this goodness and the grace of God. Grace. Come on, there's still time. Let's go. This is a family love that you would take my place. That you 